So the question is posed, why does God use Bible rather than good deeds as a standard that pleases him with respect to what we can do? And so far, all I've really said about it, well, I've said a little more than that, but, you know, basically the idea is, well, he's God, he, you know, what can you do for him? What can any of your works do for him? He doesn't need anything you can do. But he hears your thinking. And so it, it makes sort of immediate sense. Well, it pleases him to hear me think the way he likes. And since there's nothing I can do for him anyway, but it does please him if I think the way he likes, then that's enough. I mean, you know, if he wanted me to be perfectly capable at doing things, then I wouldn't be made the way I'm made. Okay, and this is really important because Satan's big argument is that we are not made properly. And God's begging the question of, is that even the purpose? Did I make you so that you can perform for me? Now, there are two answers to that. Either yes, I did, or no, I didn't. Satan's trying to argue that the answer ought to be yes, because he's all hung up on his own abilities. And he's also arguing sort of from a sense of, well, self-fulfillment, the desire to, you know, do something productive, which, you know, that partly is a good argument. Okay, but whatever we can do of ourselves and to ourselves and with each other, that never does anything for God to start with. God doesn't need anything we can do, and whatever we can do, it doesn't do anything for Him. However, the, the irony is, the very essence of what you are, your soul, thinks. God hears every thought you think. If you care about God, you want your thoughts to be pleasing to Him, just as when you care about anything or anyone else, you want to please them too. If you and I are real good friends, and you don't like something, you know, that I'm thinking, I'm not going to tell you what I'm thinking, out of deference to you. I don't want to burden you with thoughts I have I know you don't like. See what I'm saying? And of course with us it's also activities. You know, positions, beliefs, all that stuff. Okay? If you care about somebody, you respect somebody. Alright? There is a sort of circular argument. Not circular in the sense of wrong. But circular in the sense that it's full spectrum where if you care about somebody and they don't like something that you believe or you want you're going to sort of restrict yourself around them so that that unpleasantness as far as they're concerned is not expressed or seen okay that's out of deference uh, it can also be for the wrong reasons okay you're hiding from them you know so you can do it for right or wrong reasons to not expose your difference with them uh, because they don't enjoy it. They don't like it. You know, if you hate lemon meringue pie and I love it, I'm not going to eat it around you. Same kind of idea. All right. By contrast, if something they dislike is important for them to be exposed to in order to protect them well then that's a, a different situation you have to you have to say something you know and a lot of people aren't willing to do that big example is when somebody's really making a serious mistake in what they're thinking and nobody's telling them that they're making that mistake so they go right on thinking it you know and um if you don't tell them that they're making a mistake, and in a situation like that, you almost have to be blunt. It's better to be blunt than to be coy. If, if you don't just let them know, then they have no, um, how do you want to call it? 
there's nothing to help them wake up and, and rethink the matter. Okay? That's a big problem in relationships is that people do things that they shouldn't do or think things they shouldn't think and nobody bothered to warn them first. Even if they will just scoff at the warning or be mad at you for warning them, at least they got the warning. If you care about somebody, you want to make sure that they're warned. But, you know, we don't do that. We call that, you know, interference or whatever names we call it to justify walking away. So there's this full spectrum to it. But by and large, you know, if somebody, you want somebody to, um, you want to please somebody else just because you do. And... it should follow that you would want to please God the most. Now, unlike with other people, you can't hide anything from God. And if you really care about God, you want to know what He thinks in the first place, and you want to conform to that in the second, because He's God, and you want to be with Him, like Him, be compatible. Okay? So it's natural to want to have your thoughts please God, and by the way, that's the very essence of who you are. Now, everything that you would do is based on what you think. So if what you think changes to conform to his thinking because you want him to be pleased, well, then what you do is going to end up maybe not right away and maybe in glitchy fashion, but it, what you do is going to be affected by what you think. Okay? And therefore, it follows that if you're learning Bible doctrine... It's going to change how you think about God and how everything else. So it's going to change what you do also. So there is a certain amount of improvement in thinking, in competence, in being competent. Certain amount of improvement in, uh, what do you want to call it, right values, even by societal standards. There's going to be a change because you want to learn God because Bible is beyond moral. It's far higher than morality. And therefore, because you're not able to, you know, actually execute it at the level it is, you're still executing it at a higher level than if you were just a plain human without the doctrine to inform your standards. And so whatever you do is going to be better. All right. And it's going to be better for the right reasons. It's going to be better because you want to live before God by the right standards. Because it matters to you. It's a personal thing. It's not a religious thing. Religion ends up messing the whole story. Messing up the whole story. Because, you know, and it, it's part and parcel of being human. You want to please somebody. And because you want to do that, you start to think of whether you're good or bad in terms of how much you conform to whatever you think you ought to do to please that person. I want to please mommy. I'm a good girl if I please mommy. That kind of reasoning, which is obviously childish. But it's human. All right, this is part of the, the thing. So what religion does is it taps into I'm a good girl or I'm a good boy if I follow certain standards. And it tries to impose its standards between God and you and claim that those are God's standards so if you follow them you're a good boy or girl but the thing is is that religion is always far short of God's standards far short very incompetent very way off completely untrue because religion is all about getting you to perform that's not what God's about it is a standard you want to conform if you care about him. But he's the one who knows that you can't. And of course that's the big hang up that occurs. The more you find out about God through the Bible, the more you realize how high he is, how low you are and how you cannot conform. And the more you fall in love with his standards. So it hurts that you're so small and he's so high and his standards are so gorgeous and you can't conform. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. But what you don't notice, because you're so busy being upset that the standards are so gorgeous and you can't meet them, like Paul's talking about in Romans 7, 
What you don't notice is you're actually more competent than if you didn't have those standards. Okay, it's the kind of, it's the old story about you train to do a hundred push-ups, okay, and you never can actually do a hundred push-ups pretend. Okay, but when you started, you could only do one. And as a result of trying to do a hundred, you can now do five. And as a result of keep trying to do a hundred, which you never reach, you can now do ten. And pretend that your average Joe Blow could only do one. Well, then you're ten times higher than an average Joe Blow on that topic. Okay? So your strength, your competence, your stick to your motivation, because these are all the right reasons, okay? You're doing it because you want to you wanna be closer to God. You want to live more the way God's standards are. And because His standards are so high, you're not looking at your own progress. You don't notice or don't even imagine that you've progressed. You don't notice that you've become more competent than the average Joe without Bible doctrine. You have no clue that that's true. Because as far as you're concerned, you're looking at these higher standards, you're looking up at the higher standards, and the lower standards that are beyond you know, what even average humans expect. To you, to you, those standards are small. They don't even mean anything. Now, other people around you are going to notice that. They're not going to understand what's going on, but they're going to notice that you're more competent. You actually do. You become more competent, more self-determined, more um, self-organized, all these things happen to you. My pastor spent a lot of time explaining it. Um, he, he, he basically explained, and it's true, because I've seen this happen in my own life and others. Your IQ actually goes up. You actually become smarter. I mean, you could argue that it's, well, because of the doctrine, it can tap into the 98% of your brain you're not using. Because, you know, people don't use their brains. Okay? And maybe, you know, that's true. I'm not sure quite why it works the way it works. But the truth is your life becomes more organized. You become more adept at seeing the big picture, at analysis, at making good decisions. All the things, the core competencies that make for a good employee, make for a good friend, make for a good husband or wife. You actually do become more competent, but you don't think of yourself that way. Because your standards have been raised. Okay? And it's harder for you to live with the normal human standards of life. And at the same time, and this is what bugs people about it, you seem to become to them colder, less loving, because you're more analytical. You're rising into God's level and style of love rather than human love. Human love is emotional. Okay, human love changes with the wind. Okay, but God's love doesn't change. And it's all based on principle. It's all completely rooted because he wants it to be that way. He loves the Lord, loves truth and righteousness. That's Psalm 89. Your love is based on truth. You're loving the truth. And that's what the standards, the higher standards now you want to conform. This is God. You see him through the standards. You want you want to reach those standards. Of course, you never do. And it's frustrating, entirely frustrating the whole time. But you, you start, like, just, this, this becomes your life. Well, it, it takes the form of almost the sort of military, the military honor style. You know, people complain about, you know, military life, military personnel, military attitudes, because they seem to be so cold and business-like. And, oh, you don't care. Well, see, you're supposed to disregard. In order to do your job well, you have to disregard your own feelings. You have to disregard your own beliefs. You have to disregard anything and everything else but the job. And that's actually a higher love. When you're giving your all to the job, and of course the job in military, police, law, is to 
do something for the benefit of the whole, then you have to forget the personal. And there's no end of divorces in those three fields that occur because the person who's engaged in them has to live on a higher plane. Now, you don't need Bible doctrine to live on that higher plane, but it is a higher plane than normal human. And, and there many is the tale, of the, you know, the, the complaints of families of people who are in these occupations. Well, so-and-so doesn't love me. I never hear from him. He's never around. Yeah, because he's busy working for the greater all. And, and the person who's complaining is too immature in love, equates love with being around and doing things together, and doesn't recognize that the higher love is being shown. Like this one guy famously wrote, and this was in World War One. I. I think it was World War One. It might have been the Civil War. A guy wrote back to his wife, who was wondering about why he had enlisted, and he said to her in the letter, "I could not love thee, dear, so much, loved I not honor more." And you can even Google on that quote. I'll say it one more time: "I could not love thee, dear, so much, loved I not honor." more. In other words, you're, you're expressing a higher love for your family who you're not around by going to do this, this thing. You're actually sacrificing yourself for it. And the immature people do not understand that. Okay, so that's why there's so many, you know, trolls really condemning the military. All right, condemning business. They do not understand that you have to change your sights from the low, parochial, emotional, oh, this is my brother, my father, my sister, my mother. You have to go from that childish idea to the, the principal idea of the good for the whole. Then you really do love your sister, your brother, your, your, your wife, and your mother. Okay? And when you're going for God, it's way higher than that. So you seem cold because you're preoccupied. Your brain is constantly thinking in terms of truth and principles and analysis and what's right, what's wrong, how do I behave here, how do I behave there. And it sounds very dry and boring and it is definitely frustrating 100% of the time. And people don't understand that. They equate it with religion, which it can be, but it isn't necessarily the same. Everything depends on your motive and, and whether you're operating on right information. And it is a higher competence. All right? So Bible doctrine does make you more competent. It makes you into a higher person, even down here. But because it's the Bible, of course, and because it's the real God, of course, and because you're dedicated to the real Bible and the real God, well, something's wrong with you. If you attributed the behavior and the attitude and the principles to anything other than the Bible and God, everybody would praise you. But since it's the Bible and God, and it is the real God and the real Bible, not some faked version, well then something's wrong with you. So honor that would be displayed under any other name than God and Bible is praised and that honor that's not in based on the real God and the real Bible understanding is always inferior and even bad. But it's going to be praised because it's not related to God and the real Bible. It's related to some substitute because God's higher. So you're going to be a pariah to the extent anybody knows that this is what you're doing getting involved in Bible. But you will also be more competent then. Now this was the history of Israel. Okay? It happened, you know, this has always been the story. That, And it, if you actually get in the Bible, you'll realize why. Because the Bible is extremely complicated. Very, very sophisticated. Because you can't understand it as a human being. You can only really understand it through God. Okay, but when you understand it through God, that changes how you are as a human being. 
that changes all of your competencies. Well, do the same thing for Israel. And the Bible's a genius book. And the only people who don't think that are the people who don't know what it says. Okay? And, and it makes a genius out of you. It did that back then to Israel. Now, your higher authorities, kings, you know, and their advisors, they figured that out about the Jews long ago. And what they would do is there were certain occupations in particular that the nations around Israel would hire the Jews to do. They would hire them as military. Okay, in other words, they would hire them as bodyguards or they'd hire them as mercenaries or they'd that was what David was doing for the Philistines. He was hired as a mercenary. And what David managed to do cuz he was so clever at it and he got, you know, God to you know, God was directing him, is that the Philistines had other Philistines who were their own enemies and they would employ David to wipe out their enemies who were other Philistines. Well, that's good because that's divide and conquer because all the Philistines were enemies of Israel. So basically that's what David was doing. Is he was busy wiping out the enemies of certain groups of Philistines so that by the time it all got done, there were very few Philistines left to kill. <laughs> so this, you know... But they were hired as military, okay? They were hired as, um, they were hired for music. They were hired, they were talented in pretty much everything. They were hired for construction, they, you know, because that was all their 400 years of temple building in, in, in Egypt. Um, they were hired for construction. They were hired for music. They were hired for math. They were hired for medicine. They were hired for, um, Government, government bureaucracy in particular, because they were very adept at that. That's what Daniel was hired for. Um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, they were hired for a wide variety of higher functions, executive roles. Okay? They were never, how do you want to call it? low-level slaves, even when they were enslaved in Egypt. Okay, they were temple-building slaves. Okay, temple-building, as you can sometimes still find on the History Channel, was one of the most sought-after occupations um, in Egypt because it was a really cushy life. You got the best food. That's why they were complaining again to Moses about leaving Egypt because they were leaving behind food that they really liked. You got the best food. You got the best dwelling spaces. You got the best of everything because Pharaoh, you know, because Egypt was all involved in a death cult. And Pharaoh was busy, you know, building his pyramids for his death. And so they, they poured the best of everything into it. All right, and therefore, you know, your quality of your work would be affected by the quality of your food, the quality of your education, quality of your training. So they had the best of everything. So they were at the top of the slave tree. I mean, if you were, you were still a slave technically, okay. But as far as the kind of work that you did, and you know, the the time you had off, and all all the other benefits of an employee that an employee would want, they had it. They were well off compared to other, you know, Egyptian slaves. The Hebrew slaves were far better off than the Egyptian slaves because they were smarter, because they could do more, they were talented. And any smart owner of a country is going to want to employ the best people to do the best job, and he's going to reward them for it to give them incentive to do it. See, if you just beat a slave all the time, you're not going to get any good work out of them. If you beat a dog, the dog's just going to cringe all the time. So whatever it is you wanted that dog for, you're not going to get out of that dog. Okay? You have to treat your people well if you want to get good work out of them. And any anybody who owns a lot of stuff in a lot of business or a country or was a ruler, he knows that. Okay? So they were treated well and they were hired for those jobs because they were better at it. So now apply this to church. You're learning Christ's thinking. The most competent person ever born. 
you're learning to think like he is. And as you learn, of course, your standards rise. And you see how inadequate you are compared to those standards. And it bugs you 24-7. What you don't see is how much more competent than you, you are than other people. Because your standards rise, you value yourself low. But those around you are going to notice that you're more competent. You, you you get all kinds of capacities. It's really, I mean, it's really kind of hard to explain. But if you're busy studying and learning and living on Bible, you're going to have this happen to you. Okay? People are going to come up to you. Or people are going to say things to you. They're going to put you in charge of stuff. Just like they did to Joseph. You know, Pharaoh did to Joseph. Uh, not Pharaoh, but the jailer guy did to Joseph. He's going to put... He's going to put you in charge because somebody who's got a job of authority recognizes, recognizes talent, recognizes ability. That's why Daniel got promoted. Okay, you're going to end up getting put in charge. Now, maybe you're right now a janitor or something. Okay, but the upper management that's watching you. Not knowing, of course, that you're into this Bible thing unless you were foolish enough to tell them. Okay? They're going to notice that you're increasing in your competence. And they're going to be slating you for promotion. Because you're becoming more competent. Whatever it is you do. Your homemaker, a janitor, you know, or whatever. You're on the fast track. And God is going to want you to be promoted too because that gives you experience in a, a, a training set. For rule. Because you're being trained to be a king. Okay. All this claptrap about. Oh I should be poor. That's more Christian. It's a bunch of lies. It's not about really being poor or rich. It's about being trained. And you got to be trained in the high and the low. you got to be trained in the high. So you can function as a king. Okay, you got to be trained in the low so you know how to love those under you. You have, you, I mean, the first thing is you're learning why God loves you even though you're low, and that's going to transfer that understanding is kind of Bible class all by itself, twenty four seven, so that you can learn to love the low. That's Isaiah fifty four one. Instead of being upset with them, and instead of how do you want to call it? Molly coddling them. That's the problem we humans have. Is we either, oh, the poor, the poor, the poor, we got to help the poor. No. You're not helping the poor if you just give them things. If you want to help the poor, you have to learn, you have to give them like opportunities to learn things on their own that they choose. Just like you train your kids. You don't just give your kids everything. You give them little jobs so they can learn how to use, how to how to develop their own skills and their own motives so they can be self-sufficient in motive. Because it's, you got to train the inside thinking. That's all what it's about is train the thinking. You train the thinking like they said the famous aphorism. Train a, you know, feed, give a man a fish and he eats for a day. Train a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime. Okay, so you're only going to help the poor if they get trained. Throwing money at them isn't going to do it. Alright? God knows that. We're poor in thinking. We can't think like Him. So, He gives us a book to learn. And our motive for learning it is going to have to be Him, or we're going to get sidetracked into the wrong motives for learning it, and therefore won't learn anything at all. We'll be able to mouth the words and we'll have no idea what they mean. Okay, or we'll hallucinate meanings that really aren't there, or only get one dot of the whole meaning, and we'll screw it up and put it out of context. So we'll be incompetent, that's the point. Okay, in God's system, which is what? 1 John 1 9, find your right teacher, under that teacher, learn and live on Bible, talk to God about it all the time, and occasionally when warranted, and God will let you know, talk to other Christians so you can practice what you're learning. If you're in God's system, you become more competent. 
So that's really doing good deeds for the world, only you're not going to think of it that way. And it's really not your good deeds, it's the result of God building you. Okay, but Satan's busy arguing performance, and what does a person do of himself? Well, it's God doing it to you, but hi, the result really is you. God's done a lot to me, and he's doing it all the time. Okay, but it actually is a result in me. I'm becoming something. It's not my work that's making me become something, but it still is me at the end of the day. Because he likes doing it that way. And when I look at him and I look at me, I don't think of myself as being good at all. Because I'm looking at him and I'm looking at me and the it's like, well, the difference is just too great. Forget it. I'm, I'm no good. Okay, but compared to another human, I'm a heck of a lot more competent. And it's all bought by the doctrine. Okay, the, whatever human smarts I might have, they're no good. Because if you hook up your smarts with wrong attitudes or wrong beliefs or incorrect data about what the truth is, you suddenly become incompetent. I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to figure that out. Do you know how many smart people are out there who do incredibly dumb things? I mean, most of the programmers, okay, look at how incredibly stupid Windows 8 is. Okay, the people working on that are very smart, but they're absolutely clueless about the key things that would make Windows 8 good. They instead create a stupid interface that confuses everybody, and they're clueless about that. So all those billions of dollars got wasted on Windows 8 because some very smart people didn't have particular keys of understanding or were refusing to acknowledge them. And so they're dumber than the dumb people. A dumb person would never have designed Windows 8 that way. A dumb person would have thought, okay, what do I know? What's easy to do? And his design would have been basically based on what what he knows and what's easy to do. Yeah, that's the smartest way to do it. Use what's commonly understood and use what's easy to do. Because we all got too damn many things to do during the day. We need it to be easy. Okay, but if you're smart, you overcomplicate things. I mean, your average legislative aide in Congress who's working for a senator or a representative is very smart and yet very stupid. We have the stupidest laws on the books in the United States that we've ever had. The stupidity started sometime, oh, I want to say sometime just after Roosevelt. The best tax code we had was 1953. It got really dumb after that. Okay, the, the RISA, which was um, 1974, that's when the law became insane absolutely insane but the people making that law were very smart they were so full of themselves and so full of their intent on micromanaging law they, they missed the forest for the trees and that's what, the way it is with smart people they missed the forest for the trees okay well when you got Bible doctrine you're able to see the forest so you become more competent more organized you work on what's essential, you learn to simplify. So, the first answer to why did God pick knowing the Bible rather than good deeds is, hello, if you can't think your way out of a paper bag, it doesn't matter how smart you are. Doesn't matter how strong you are. Doesn't matter what you can do. You can't do it well. You can't do it in the right context so that all the other pieces of all the other people that have to be involved in whatever it is you're doing can be integrated properly because you can't see the big picture. Bible doctrine teaches you how to see the big picture because, hi, the big picture is the face of God. So, that's why God picks Bible. So that you can see Him. We all know that. It pleases him. Why? Because it's how he thinks, and therefore you want to think the same way. Your thinking is changing to be more like his. And hello, who's more competent than God? 
who knows the truth? God is the truth. So now you start to know the truth. That affects how you make decisions. You start to see what the truth is. And it's very frustrating all the time. It hurts all the time. You feel like a jackass all the time. In terms of the emotion, it's never, it's never, well, not never pleasant, but almost never pleasant. But in terms of competence, it's much higher. So the first reason why God picks Bible is because it pleases him to hear you think properly. The way he does. And it's one dot at a time. And it's real small. And you're a little baby and I want to see God. Okay. But he's hearing you think, I want to see God. Rather than somebody else thinking, mm, you know, I want a lollipop. Or I want to wear this dress to the party so John Doe will notice me. I mean, there's kind of a big quality difference, don't you think? And since you want to see God, you're going to start thinking differently about everything else around you. You're not going to have so many of those stupid, petty thoughts that are normally in the human race. So the quality of your thinking improves. The quality of your relationships, therefore, improve also. Because you're not looking at people and things in this world the way normally people in th in this world look at it. You're not being petty. You're growing away from that. You're not being low-minded and grasping and trying to get something from people because you're too busy learning God. And you rely on Him for your needs. See how this is changing you? You actually really are becoming more competent. Notice the difference. You're becoming more competent. You're getting more abilities. You are not becoming a better person. Big difference. A person is whoever the person is. The abilities are whatever they are. In other words, you got two people. One person can speak 12 languages and we automatically equate that with being a better person than somebody who can barely speak English. Okay? We ascribe, we as assume that a person's abilities are the same thing if they're good. If we call the abilities good, we call the person good. That's not true. The abilities are the abilities. The core of the person is the core of the person. They're two different things. So your abilities improve markedly. Your competence, your coherence, your ability to think, all those things improve markedly. But you're still you. In other words, you still have your vulnerabilities, you still have your flaws, you still have your concerns, you still have your, you know, whatever it is, fears, hang-ups. Those all remain too. The struggle remains too. That's what Paul's saying in Romans 7. Paul wrote scripture. But you can tell from Romans 7 he was the same guy he was that when Christ found him on the Damascus road. The core of you always stays the same. You don't improve. Not this side of heaven. You can't. You're born with a sin nature. It gets into your soul. And it's still there. And the longer you live, the more sins you sin. So the worse you become, if you're going to talk about becoming a person, how good you are as a person, the longer you live, the more you sin. So the day you were born, you were perfect. Because God creates the soul at birth and imputes it. That moment, you were perfect. Your body wasn't, but your soul was. After that, well, five minutes later, two minutes later, you start to cry. Then sin gets into your soul because God wouldn't cry. And then from there on, every other, you know, five minutes, two minutes, one minute, an hour, you're sinning some sin. So by the time you're dead, you've sinned billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of sins. So, technically speaking, you are worse than the day you were born. But you have alongside that. 
abilities that you learn humanly, talents, some of them are genetic, others are acquired, you trained in some of those abilities, so you actually, you know, are able to use whatever your talents are. An untrained talent is, generally speaking, not worthwhile. You always have to work on a talent, whatever talent you got. But you have another talent if you get into God's system. A talent for thinking. And that will inform all of your actions. And that will make your actions more competent. Alongside the fact that you're actually worse every day that passes than you were the day before because more sin has entered your life. Even though you're using 1 John 1 9, okay, it's removing all the juridical effects of the sin, but it's not removing, you know, the, the what you want to call it, the real effects of the sin. Real in the sense of the real impact on your life and your body. In other words, if I do something, if I think something wrong, then I've just increased my proclivity to do it again. And yeah, I name my sin to God and I'm forgiven so I can continue to learn God but I still have this increased proclivity to sin the same sin again that's why it's important to try to you know grow out of sins and I will but not only by Bible doctrine do you grow out of sins if you're gay for example the only way you're going to stop being gay is to learn Bible so well that you don't want to be gay anymore okay but that takes time my biggest well it's not my biggest sin but one of my one of my big habitual sins is like I'm constantly angry at Windows. I hate it. I hate computers, period. Okay? And I haven't grown out of that yet. But I keep using one John one nine. Okay? So you see, there's always gonna be sin habits. And technically speaking, it means you're degenerating. But at the same time, you've got these other abilities that God's giving you, especially to think and to learn Him, and they counteract, to a certain extent, the degeneration, and they give you other abilities alongside the degeneration. That's really what's going on. Okay, well now, go, flipping back to Satan's argument, because I want to close this out. Satan's saying, well, why the Bible? What good deed is just learning Bible? Well, it's the best deed of all, really. First, because, uh, hello, God made you, and where should your loyalty be? And he's going to bless the world if you learn his son. And you can't do the good deeds he can do. I mean, that's juridical. That just should be a no-brainer. But, if you're concerned about, well, what about the abilities in the human and what I can do of myself? Even though there's nothing you can do of yourself, not even breathe, But if you're going to lie to yourself and claim you're doing something of yourself, okay, fine. God's doing something to you that makes you able to do whatever it is you're doing better. Every moment you breathe. The result really does happen in you. And it will result at times in people recognizing that in being promoted and all kinds of other stuff that comes your way. Because it's 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 definitely an increase in competence. Okay? Your competence is increasing and people will notice that and they'll use you for it. So that's one answer to Satan. Now is God being arbitrary? You bet. But look at the result that he himself is causing. Is Satan being arbitrary? You bet. And they're both arguing now on an apples to apples basis. I want something I can do for God. Well, you are doing something for God. The number one thing and the only thing you can do for God. Think well. And by the way, because you're thinking well, because you're getting his standards in your head, and it feels terrible most of the time, but you're still doing it. Okay, well that makes you more competent in the stuff you're doing in the world too. You start caring more about doing a good thing right. You start caring more for truth, righteousness, justice. You become more dedicated to whatever it is you're doing to getting it right. 
because it starts mattering to you that it's right. It becomes more important that what you do, not others, what you do is right, no matter what it costs, no matter what you get for it, no matter that you could do something else and get away with it. In other words, you start having a conscience and your own sense of self-fulfillment changes such that your happiness by your own free will is becoming progressively more based on I want to do what's right. You're going to name it other things. You're going to like, oh, you know, I should obey God. Okay, but really it's progressively becoming you saying you should obey God. It's your own motive. It's not because the Bible says so, although you'll be pointing to it all the time. And you, you'll hang on to it. You'll actually grasp it as a security device. But it is your own motive. And you won't recognize that for the longest time. You want to do what God wants. Because He wants it. It matters to you. You believe in it. And so your happiness is now progressively changing from whatever pleases your body to what pleases your soul. And your soul is changing to what pleases God as the standard. And it's progressive. And it's slow. And you don't notice it. And you're still thinking in terms of, I'm a good girl or a bad girl if I do this. I'm a good boy or a bad boy if I do this. And it's based on, you know, well, God says this, and if I don't do this, I'm bad. And I don't really want to do this, so now I feel guilty because I really don't want to do this. I better do this anyway, and you fight back and forth with yourself all day. Okay, but that's a good thing. The standards are fighting with each other. Your old sin nature is trying to glom on to a change that's growing in you in the standard of God. And meanwhile, you're becoming more competent and you won't recognize it. But others will. Well, that's doing a good deed for the world. Only you don't think of it that way. But it is doing a good deed for the world that's actually competent for change. Versus the world's own standards which share some of you know, wanting to do right. There's some of that in the world. But it has a very low price. Okay? People quit. They, they, they talk about, oh, we want righteousness, we want justice, right, wrong, moral, immoral, yada, yada. Okay, but they, they cut corners. It's real easy to, how do you want to call it? abandon what's right to quit in the human race. The human race is very fickle and everybody's got a price for doing right and the price is very low. Okay, in other words <clears throat> they're willing to do right so long as it doesn't cost them too much and to them, the cost, their perceived cost, that they're, you know, once they perceive the cost is too high, they're not going to be right, they're not going to do it anymore, that it's very low. So infidelity has a very low threshold, okay, in the human race. You can't really trust anybody. You can't really believe in anybody. Your brother, your sister, your father, your mother will mean well, will, you know, try to be loyal to you and all that good stuff. But it's real easy to just turn against you. The Bible's full of those stories, okay? So, I mean, and you, you know your own stories. You've seen it happen in your life. Boyfriends cheat on girlfriends. Husbands cheat on wives. Wives cheat on husbands. 
children betray their parents or steal from their parents or all kinds of things that we do to each other. It doesn't take much for us to want to hurt each other. And we'll always justify it. We'll always justify it and blame the other person for our actions. So we betray each other at a very, for a very low price. It's kind of like 1984. Where John Hurt, when he's looking at the rats, Winston, his character's name is Winston in 1984, He's looking at the rats and he finally says, do it to Julia. So that he wouldn't have to hurt. Before they even they even get there. We betray each other very cheaply. When you have Bible doctrine in your soul, you're still you'll still go through the typical human, you know, fickleness. But it the longer you stick with it the more uh, faithful you'll become. And people will notice that too. And the whole goal of Satan and company is to get you to betray God, as it were, to quit. Just like, you know, the story of Job. Where Job's wife said to him, curse God and die. That was the goal, is to get Job to quit on God. It didn't happen. You grow enough in the spiritual life, it won't happen to you either. That doesn't mean you don't sin. It's about whether you quit the spiritual life, whether you quit God's system. Okay, 1 John 1 9, staying on, getting your pastor, learning and living on Bible under whoever God appoints as your pastor, and he might change the pastor from time to time. Talking to God all the time and occasionally talking to believers. Whatever makes you quit that system. is what Satan and company are going to try and make you do. And the more loyal you, the longer you stay in the system, the more loyal God will make you become. It, it, he changes your character. Alright? He literally changes your character. But it's like you're on life support the whole time. That's why I want to make sure you understand. 1 John 1 9 is your life support. Your character will go back to your real self overnight the minute you stop using one John one nine. Okay, those big sins that we saw David sin. Okay, he went back to being David without doctrine, even though he was mature in doctrine. The David Bathsheba thing. David was mature when he did that. He was spiritually mature. But miniature and sin, that's my pastor like to call it. It's it's um, Hyde and Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hyde was a bad guy. So David turned into Mr. Hyde the minute he sinned, and so will you. You know, Paul basically betrayed the whole message of church when he gave in to the Nazarite vow in Acts 21 and 22. Okay? He had, that was the second time he had done it. The first time he had done it was sometime before Acts 18, and... He's standing at the port in Cancrea and his hair is long because he was waiting to get on the boat, go to Jerusalem and cut his hair at the altar. That's the way the Nazarite vow worked. And he realized what an idiot he was and that's why Luke Riley records him as cutting his hair in Cancrea before he gets to Jerusalem because he realizes he's an idiot. Then he no sooner gets there than James talks him into funding six other Jews who are going to do the Nazarite vow. Well, but the law no longer applies. Why did Paul do that? Paul had a lot of money, see. And Paul thought he would buy the favor of the Jews by catering to their false doctrine. That's how far out of fellowship he was. And he was warned about it before he even got there by Agabus. Okay, and that's in, uh, I want to say, Acts 21. And, you know, everybody with them realized that Paul was being warned. And they fell silent because there was no talking to him. He was, oh, I'm going to die if I go to Jerusalem. Oh, I'm willing to die for God. He was so full of himself. It's all recorded in Acts 21. You can read it yourself. My pastor covered that at length in a series he called Paul's Fall in about April of 1999 through about June of 1999. That series changed my life. 
um, you can fall when you're a mature, super mature believer, even like Paul. And it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When he's in fellowship, he's Dr. Jekyll. When he's out of fellowship, immediately it's as if he never learned any doctrine at all. And he becomes completely, you know, betrayal. So the real you, okay, is kind of, is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Because it's really you also who God is building. But it only works when that light bulb is on due to 1 John 1 9. That whole side of you is turned off the minute you sin. So you see, you're not a better person. You're basically two people. One gradually taking over the other one. And the takeover doesn't actually occur until death. So you're kind of living in two spheres, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's who you really are once you start being in God's system for a while. <clears throat> or else, you know, if you don't get into God's system, you're just Mr. Hyde all the time. Religious Mr. Hyde, lascivious Mr. Hyde, take your pick in between. So, you see, Bible doctrine really does have an impact on what you do. Even by human standards of good deeds, it has a huge impact. But it's like a light switch. And whatever good you do and whatever talents you have, okay, the minute you sin, all that talent and all that ability is going to be is going to actually have a negative leverage and put you in more doo doo, just like it did to David. When David sinned, he caused a lot of trouble. All of his abilities and all of his leadership, everybody admired him for that. Okay, but when he sins, he's giving bad orders, like the order to kill Uriah the Hittite. So you're either very, very good or very, very bad, and it all depends on whether that one John 1 9 light switch is on. So it's really God's power, not yours. The result really is happening in you, but only He can run it. But. When you are between sins, and you are therefore in God's system, then you really are doing good deeds, even on a human level. Because you're enabled by God deeds, which changes your thinking, therefore changes your action, and God's hearing the thinking He wants to hear. Peace out.